Hi, and welcome to Spooky Isles. My name's David Saunderson. Today we have a very special guest, Stuart Morris, who's the filmmaker producer behind a new short horror from here in London called Paradolia. Uh, Stuart is well known in London horror circles as one of the minds behind Misty Moon. Besides, besides running some excellent film and TV events, which I've attended over the years, he's been producing some really, really great uh, short horror films and uh, over the last couple of years. And Paradolia, which came out a couple of months ago, uh, is one of them. How are you, Stuart? I'm fine, thank you. How are you, David? Good, thank you. Uh, you looks like it's quite cold there where you are in. Uh, it is deepest dark. In the south, in south of deepest darkest uh, <laughs> uh, Sussex. Uh, congratulations on Paradolia. I mean, it's it's a really really spooky film. H how did it all come about? You've got some really really famous names involved. Thank you, thank you. Yes. So what happened was I've made quite a few films before, um, and Diane Franklin's a friend of mine, so she's. In it. And for a long time, I've been um, trying to get her to be in a film. And she's always said, I'm, I never do shorts. I only do features still. But because it's you and Jen, my lovely wife, and I trust you, if the script is good, then I will give it a thought, a go. So I spoke to Jen and said, look, I want to move away from the other directors um, and try something different. Diane wants to do it. It's got to be something special. And she said, well... We also hold the Misty Moon International Film Festival, and there was a guy uh, called Aaron Truss who had a film in two years ago uh, called The Understudy, and he's a young director. And Jen said, well, why don't you give him a call? Just come up with the idea of what you want to do. So I called him up. I said, "Would you first of all, would you like to direct a film uh, with Diane Franklin? And I heard this thud where he'd fallen off his chair. And he then got back up and said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to. Have you got an idea? And I said, well, yeah, my idea is I live in a little medieval cottage um, in deepest darkest East Sussex. I've got a big Inglenook fireplace, lovely big pink chair. I want her just to sit in it and we film her telling a ghost story. And he said, well, we can do that, but I'm sure I can do something slightly better. And within a couple of days, he'd gone off, come back with this title called Paradolia. Um, which I didn't know what Paradolia was. He'd gone to his dad, Aidan Truss, who's uh, a writer who's written a book called Gape, uh, a novel called Gape, and they'd come up with this treatment for this film uh, that from where it was just going to be one uh, cast member, it had gone to five and big locations. And I said, okay, let's try it. We could get a budget together. It's Diane Franklin, tr let's try and get something special. And it just padded out into the film that we've got now. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just say the, the little the plot that it sort of says when you, when you talk about the plot because it's it's you have to watch it. It's you, yeah. It's, whatever, a single woman alone in her house can't be sure if the changing pictures and shapes around her are real or whether someone is watching her. Yeah. And that just sounds creepy in itself. Yeah. So uh, pareidolia is um, if you look it up in the dictionary, it is what people see in an inanimate object. So I might be looking at a a um, cloud and I see a face in it and you may not see anything in it it's what your mind projects as it says in the film Jesus on a dog's bum you know it's anything like Jesus in a coffee cup or something and I think there's one doing the rounds at the moment I've seen on social media of you look at Liverpool Lime Street platform but then if you squint you see John Lennon's face it's that yeah. type of thing, and it's 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 used a lot in uh, in sort of paranormal investigation because people say, "Well, I can see a ghost in that picture," and it mm. you know it, it could just be a blur, and it probably might look like That's a face, it. but it's what you see. So yeah. it is one of those things about like when you're in middle of the when you're in bed in middle of the night, you open your eyes and you see a bit of a light and you see a figure there. That's but, it. Uh, and I won't give anything away from the film, but there's a really cool effect which I don't know how you did, but with the it looks really cool. Yeah, the, the, the black I mean. black thingy there, but you, people will yeah. see that. So now you've got some really you, you've 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 got Diane Franklin, of course, is very very famous for having been in Amityville Two, which I believe is a one of your favourite films. It is it's it's a very underrated film from nineteen eighty two, and um, I did when I was at college, I did a thesis on um, just the Amityville horror. The whole thing really, you know, um, intrigues me and. Um, when we had our little gallery, uh, so Misty Moon started off in London, um, in South East London, in, we had a little art gallery. And just to give you a bit of background, um, Adrian King from Friday 13th came over from the original Friday 13th, and she um, put, she displayed her artwork there. And because we did a private view and a lot of the fans came, she said, 
but it's a, such a no lovely space. Let's put out some tickets and see if anyone wants to come and watch um, Friday the 13th. So we did that, um, put tickets up £5, come watch Friday the 13th with Adrian King, and within an hour, all the tickets are sold. It could only hold 40 people. And, um, and because that was such a success, they were watching Friday the 13th in like this garage come art gallery behind a pub in South East London. She said, let's, I'm going to put my name to this. And she co-founded Misty Moon with us, the film society part of Misty Moon with me and Jen. Um, and off the back of that, we had like Michael Berryman came, Ken Foray, Caroline Munro, Fenella Field. And that's how it all started um, when we were behind this little pub. And it, it is surprising to think we had all these iconic Hollywood actors and actresses there watching their film with a pub next door. Then they'd go off and have a drink in the pub. We even had Michael Berryman after showing The Hills Have Eyes. Um, singing karaoke you know i mean it was mad so that's going back 10 years ago so that's how that all started so um and that's how i i got to meet diane she came over five uh she came over for a week and we showed five of her films ending um over five nights ending with um amityville and i think the thing about the amityville horror well that particular one even now i can't watch it really on my own it's the sound, the music, it's, and there's just something about it that's really creepy. Forget about Conjuring or even The Exorcist. I think it's more frightening than The Exorcist. Okay, well, that's uh, a very, very big call then, isn't it? So um, that's how you at, remember it. And where we filmed Paradolia, our cottage has got that look. In fact, the village, a lot of the places around here have got the look of the Amityville house because they're like all white weatherboarded buildings. So it has got that Dutch colonial thing to it. Um, so that's how I got Diane. Uh, she she loved the script that Aidan had written anyway, and uh, and she said, "Yeah, I would love to do it." Uh, and that's how that happened with her. And because of the other um, things that we do with the TV and film events, I've got a book now of people um, that I can just click through and ask if they would like to do it. Uh, and so I'm a casting director on the, all the films I do as well. I'm not just produce; I cast it. Yeah, no, you've got a, a really big list of people, and you, you you note that when you have your events, and there'll be quite eclectic yeah. type of people from all across television and film and all sorts of things. But you do tend to do quite a lot of, as you said, you've named a whole lot of people, 1980s horror. That's clearly well, a, a bit of a passion of yours. Yeah, well, that's another way where I met Aaron Truss. He did a, um, a film that was at Fright Fest last year, a documentary called Cult of VHS, and it had our friend in it, Graham Humphreys, yeah. Uh, the wonderful uh, artist, 80s horror artist, who does a lot of posters for us now that I can't believe. Um, that's fantastic. And that is my era. So when he, he came to me, well, I came to him about this idea with Diane. And then he said, well, we're doing a, a documentary called VHS. It'd be good if you could. We've got Graham Humphreys talking about video nasties. Um, would you like to do that? And I said, well, that's right up my street because I was... 13, 14, 15, when that whole video nasty thing was coming out, we had a little video shop at the end of our road, not a Blockbusters, it was a record shop with a little bit of uh, video in there. And so I used to go and get the old horror films, some of the really bad ones as well, the man used to have under the thing, take them back home and watch them. And that's where my love of 80s horror has come from. I mean, when we first started Misty Moon, one of our first guests we had was Caroline Munro, who everyone knows from the Hammer films. I'd never watched a Hammer film because that wasn't my bag. My thing was 80s slashers. Friday 13th, yeah. Halloween, happy birthday to me, Nightmare on Elm Street. That's what I was into. Yeah. When you say, you know, and I, I know what you're talking about because, like, you know, we would have had our own video shops as well before, you know, just they weren't, they were independent ones. So yeah. this is the old days when you would have, you, could, you think of the weird films you might have watched back in those days, you'd never watch any more. But yeah. what do you mean by, I mean, video nasties in Australia, I know what they are. They're the ones that basically got banned, but because they were banned, you never saw them. And it's stuff like yeah. Day of the Dead or things that you watch now, you think, why the, why'd they bother? What are the ones you were getting underneath the counter? What, tell me about so that. The That's ones they had, it was the Boogie secretive. Man. The Boogie yeah. Man uh, or the Boogie Man. Uh, there was that one. Uh, there was Driller Killer. The Burning, now the Horror Channel, 
which is on you can get on sky and they're showing the burning now and i think i think it is still a certificate 18 but they banned that evil dead the original evil dead that was banned so it's all of those type of films not so much the friday the 13th none of friday 13th actually but it was all of those type of films and i think it was our media that was really pushing it a mary whitehouse so the sun got behind it i remember center pages of ban evil dead Mm -hmm. and that and my mum used to say to me why do you watch all these films she said if there was a murder around here the police would be coming knocking on your door because on our door for you because you'll be the prime suspect because you watch all these films yeah i always thought they looked more horrible because some of the special effects weren't so great and they look like a place like the evil dead basically is plasticine really and it just looks more gross because and when you see you see a thing nowadays on the on a movie on the television and it's natural like blood I don't yeah. look as bad as some no. of those 1980s ones. They look more no. disgusting because, like, Hammer Horror, Red Blood, was that stuff doesn't look like blood. That looks like paint. Paint. <laughs> right, yeah. Or ketchup. But um, I think also it, it was, you know what the press are like, they jump onto something and they run with it, but it was the Mary Whitehouse. I mean, she was stopping lots of Doctor Who. She was always complaining. There was a famous, uh, I think it was the Deadly Assassin, Tom Baker one. There was an image at the end of whoever was after the Doctor was pushing him and drowning him under the water. And that last scene, you could just see Tom Baker's face under the water with his eyes open as if he had died. And it was that that she tried to ban. But you know that once she did that or complained about it, the next week, the viewing figures for the next episode went through the roof. That's right. So you can thank Mary Whitehouse for for, for that. Yeah. So, of course, we want to make make it clear that Paradolia isn't a grossy top film. There, it's scary. Not at all. It's, not, it's got nothing yeah. like this. So no one's going to go. Well, that's 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 vile. But uh, it does have the spookiness in it. It's it, it it's a it's a ghost thing, isn't it? Is that it's how you describe story, it? It's really. a it's a ghost yeah. film. Yeah, it's a ghost story. Um, we've even cut it down to no bad language. I think there's just one uh, curse in it uh, towards the end. And yeah, there's no blood, there's no gore. It's very cleverly lit. Um, I had a fantastic team I worked with on it. Um, and the director, Aaron, was very, very good at it. And he's an editor, he edited it. Um, but it, it, if you look, there's a lot of homages to Carpenter because it's all about the music as well, um, all the soundscape. And that's why I've told people when we sent it out to reviewers, or to test audiences before it went to Fright Fest. Um, I've said always wear headphones if you're watching it on a device or on a laptop or something because it's the soundscape that makes it. You pick so much up. Yeah. And if you were just watching it, unless you're in a cinema, we we showed it at Fright Fest um, with a 5.1 surround sound, and we were in the super screen at the um, Cineworld, and they were watching The Exorcist next door, and they could hear it next door. Okay. It's fantastic. So, yeah, no, it, it, it sounds great, but it also looks beautiful. And I think that's when you say the fact that you've used your own house, you've used the area around All the there, locations around and here. You, yeah. And you don't get that normally, do you? You don't get that in films because they're all, I don't know, they, they seem to be in, on a sound, you know, like on a stage somewhere or uh, in somewhere in London. The only place that we did um, use a studio was the mortuary scene and the at the beginning and the hospital and that was at the west london studios and that was fantastic you know i do sometimes suffer a bit with uh health anxiety i don't like doctors hospitals and that directly you walk into there i could feel the hairs on the back of my necks standing up because it felt like you were actually just walking into a hospital and it's yeah. it's a great set but everywhere else on location it was filmed in robert's bridge when you see the people outside the cottage when i'm not giving too much away but when graham turns up towards the end uh graham cole turns up towards the end all of those are villagers here um our neighbors i just knocked on a few doors saying look we're gonna have some police cars outside we are filming we do need a couple of people so if a few of you just want to line up turn up at six o'clock and i thought we were going to have about 10 people we had 40 of them turn up and they all loved it and we had the cast and crew screening um in london a couple of weeks ago and all the the people from robert's bridge came up they had an away day up to london and they loved it yeah and you say you, you mentioned graham cole so you've got graham cole from uh, the bill and you had carolyn yep. pickles from the bill yeah uh, you also had another uh famous what i'm trying to work out the way to say a voiceover 
We did. So we had um, one of my favourite films and why I became a filmmaker is Halloween, the original Halloween. And um, I become very good friends with Sandy Johnson via the powers of Facebook. And during the first lockdowns, Misty Moon had to go, or, well, we didn't know what we were going to do with our gigs. All our gigs were closed down like everyone else. So we decided to put them online and do Zoom to see if it worked. And I contacted Sandy and she said, oh, I'd love to come on. Uh, and we had quite a big audience for her online. Um, and so we were doing this type of thing, you know, and it really, really worked. And I, I said to her, look, we're doing this film. Um, we would love to do something with you. And she couldn't come over. Uh, so we did a, a voiceover for her and, um, and we did it like this. So we, uh, myself and Aaron and Sandy got together and um, she did, yeah, she plays DJ Mickey Myers. You see what we did there, did and uh, yeah. and it's um, a homage of from the fog. It's a homage yeah. from the fog. Yeah, and as people don't know, she played Judith Myers, who's Michael Myers' mother in the original. Sister, sister, Oldest. sorry, sister. Sorry, I'm getting yeah. it mixed up. I'm getting yeah. the mother mixed up with Friday the Thirteenth. That's right. Yeah, I'm you are. You're sister. thinking of um, sister. Yeah. So if it wasn't sorry. for um, Sandy's character Judith, there'd be no Halloween, really. And she's her character's mentioned like Michael throughout every single part of the Halloween franchise, no matter which which timeline you go for, whatever. She's always mentioned in it. Yeah. So we just you have these fantastic people, and I just think that over the years I've seen you know been attending some of your events and you know seen what you're doing, and you've got so many amazing people. It'd be you potentially could make the ultimate horror film with the the best people I love to. alive. I would love to. Yeah, love to. You know, someone did say to me, you know, I, I'm going to be doing a, a short scene. I've been asked to do a short scene for um, a director called Tony Marden. He's do. You may know Tony. Uh, he's doing a film called The Witches of the Sands. It's a feature film. And he's got Lynn Lowry in it, Deborah Lamb. Um, and he's got Lanier Quigley. And he's asked yeah, me to cool. be in uh, a scene with her because she's coming over to do Dark Fest in a couple of weeks' time. And when he wrote about it, about, oh, we've now got Stuart Morris, he's worked with everyone. And I sat back and I thought, well, actually, yeah, I'm, I have. <laughs> but all of that is stems back to Adrian having that faith in us and putting her name to it. Um, and that's where it's just exploded. Yeah. And of course, you you do appear in this film as a as a I something. Do. As a as well, a, I a, do. A, I no, I normally in all the other films, I've always done a bit for Hitchcock, just like walk in the background or a picture on a wall or something like that. But for this one, um, the director said that his dad was going to write me into it, and he's named the character after um my mentor the lovely dudley sutton who passed away a few years ago oh, yes, and so that. yeah he's named after that we've also got not giving it too much away there's a another character who's named after fenella fielding who was another one of our yes uh, you absolutely was people. yeah so yes so uh, you you do a lot of stuff with the bill like i said we said before we've got graham yep. cole in this you've got carolyn pickles and you've and you and i think last <laughs> night you uh you did a, another reunion for the bill yeah, that was the Bill Reunion 9. So, um, yeah, these are, but the Bill was a, a staple for any out of work actor, really, at the time. It ran for 20 odd years. Graham was, I think he did something like 16,000, 1600 episodes in it. And, you know, he's the longest standing member of it. Um, and the Bill fans, they, we do these at the Cinema Museum. So, because it's a, a bit bigger than the phoenix arts club the stage is bigger you can have about five to eight guests on stage and so yesterday we had with graham six he emcees it for us now and we showed pareidolia because caroline carolyn was there and he was there the bill fans loved it they all jumped out of their seats all in the right places which is great um but but the bill fans are a bit like horror fans they're the nicest people you know, I've always said horror fans are fantastic. The Bill fans are the same. They know your life better than you do. They know every single thing about the episodes. And they just, and they're so polite. So after the Q&A, they get to meet 
um, the guests and they all queue up. They wait patiently to go around, have their pictures taken, get autographs and stuff like that. And, and it was, and it's just a wonderful thing, really. Um, yeah. When I was growing up in Australia, it was on at eight thirty on a Saturday night, and I think it was very popular, and everyone watched it. And you know, I would have America watched it and all. Australia, but I think Australia's got a bigger fan base than America. And again, going back to lockdown. Um, because we were, I think, something like on the Bill reunion four or five then, um, and we had we had one actually booked, and we cancelled that and said, "Oh, it's going to come back. We should be back in June." I think it was booked for the April, but of course, the first our first lockdown went on for months, um, and so we put them online and we started again from zero. And I think again we went up to about uh, the Bill reunion seven online because we were doing them like every other month. But the good thing was because it was online, it could go out to anywhere in the world. And we had people in Australia that were getting up at three in the morning to join us. But the difference is, um, our big reunions, they're normally on stage, the live ones, they're normally on stage for an hour and a half and then the meet and greet after. These were going on for three or four hours. And the cast gave their time. They just loved it. Graham was always on there. We had Suzanne Madder, who was Cass Rittman, all of them came on carolyn pickles was on there uh and and but it was going out and meeting fans from whenever so when we said right we're not going to do any more because we now can do in person again they were all very very sad so we've got to try and do a way of getting them back so the because we never record anything because i've always got this idea that if you record a gig and then you put it out that anyone can watch it on youtube that may stop people coming to see it live yeah of so course it of, is. yeah so there's got to be a way of maybe doing a Zoom at the same time, a technical way, so they can be part of it as it's going out. So we're going to be looking into that. Yeah, that'd be fabulous. What other kind of things you've got, got coming up? Because I, I just, I was, actually, I'll move back to what I was just about to ask. Paradolia was a very, very good film. It's only a short film. It's only about 12 minutes. Surely there's a ability for you to do something more with that. Do you have any ideas of, how, would you consider making it into a feature film? Well, it's being made into one if, well, it's been written now. So um, I spoke to the director, his dad, um, Aidan, who wrote it, he said he had the baby, he's created the baby, he's now handing that over because we were hoping he was going to write the feature, but he's decided he's going to hand the baby over to myself and to Aaron, the director, to take it further, to mature it. So Aaron is working on a treatment now for a feature. I can't give too much away, but it is very close to where this one yeah. uh, finishes. Uh, so we're hoping by Christmas to have a four-page treatment that we can start going out saying, yeah. this is what we've got, and to get people involved with it. Because the reviews we've had, and, you know, shorts, they get good reviews. They could do the f festivals. For me, when we did this, um, once I started to read it and I started to cast it, I, I'm going to be 56 in January, and I just thought, when well, you know, it's great to do what, uh, a film to win awards and go to festivals, but for me, this is like a calling card to show, if this is what we can do on this minuscule budget, imagine what we can do on a large one, because this could be the last time I get a chance to really do a feature, if you see what I mean. So, I, don't, I don't know about that. I don't think <laughs> you're saying quite dismissive. You're still quite young, and you've still got yeah. many, many things to be doing from now on. But it is a good opportunity, and I think this film, you know, there's lots of questions that you could be asking. Well, why is that happening? Why that? You know, it doesn't really matter because it's a short film, and it's it's about the atmosphere and the spookiness and all that kind of stuff. But I can see how you could have backgrounds to it and working out why things are happening it could be really, really quite interesting. And yeah, and what happens next? There is a big question mark about what happens to John T, the Mont Moultrie attendant. And I think it's all, yeah, I'm not going to give too much away, but he's working hard on it. He hasn't really told me too much, only um, that he's got now a name for the village where it was set. Um, he's come up with that, so it'll be set again, hopefully, in the same area. And, and that's the other thing. Um, we had two American actresses in it. I know a lot of fan fan films uh they make films with english actors putting on american accents and it's meant to be set in america and and then all of a sudden you see a fiat punto driving past a welsh sign but it's meant to be in the middle of texas this isn't meant to be in america it's meant to be an american uh teacher who's moved to england yeah 
And there's lots of them, but plenty of Americans yeah. here. So it's not like yeah. that's an amazing. And what I'm saying is, I can understand because I think, like, when you watch something like Hellraiser and things like that, you know, they have sort of have an American y type, you know. Yeah. And you know, you know it is Britain, but yeah. Yeah. they do it in weird ways at times. And that, that, that's really good. Cool. So, what have you got? And then my next thing, when I'll come back to what I was going to come back to, what have you got coming up? I know you've got a, another Battle and Smith uh, event coming up. That's in that's a week tomorrow. Uh, Madeline Smith, more tales to tickle your fancy with Madeline Smith. We've known Maddie for uh, from our old gallery days. She used to come and do gigs with us, and then she'd just come and sit in the audience as well. So she's a big supporter of Misty Moon. They they they're great gigs. She's she's got some tales. So she's she. You've met her before. She's lovely. Um, but before that, tomorrow, we have got Still Behaving Like Colts with yes. Robin Asquith and George Layton. I think this is the third or fourth one we've done at the Phoenix with them. Um, and basically, it's George and Robin. They go on stage, and they don't have an MC. They just talk amongst themselves or bicker, and then they open it to the audience. And, you know, the evening flies by and i think with that one we put that up on sale back in april and it sold out within a day yeah yeah i mean i've not seen them on stage i think that'd be a lot, lot of fun i've seen the madeline one I, was, I saw one of the ones that you did that was fair, lots of fun and really interesting but i imagine it's a bit crazy i can you, you're, doing that on, you're doing the you're doing the george and uh, robin one on a monday night i could almost see that being a friday or a yeah. saturday school yeah. fest really couldn't it yeah it could it could unfortunately well not unfortunately for us but um the phoenix the monday night is our night basically at the yeah. phoenix and um they we're very lucky now that the phoenix uh we're the only outside company that they have in all the rest of the stuff is in-house so we always get a monday night and um and we can stay till two in the morning if we want to so tomorrow night mm. jen and i will be staying up we are going to stay in london not rush back for that last train it takes us an hour and a half from london back home on yeah. the rattler <laughs> well you'll have a you'll have a good one uh, tomorrow yeah. night so other than that we've got so you, you know paradolia it's going really well who knows it could become an, a feature film we, we can only Fingers hope crossed. what other things have you got coming up before christmas and beyond so uh paradolia is getting another screening at uh the genesis cinema on the 25th of November with at Dartfest 666. Yep. So we're going to be there. Um, I'm taking Carolyn Pickles, uh, Aaron Truss is coming, and Dawn Perlman. I've got Dawn Perlman's in it from The Omen, of course. She oh, plays yeah. the Dr. Fielding. Um, so she's going to, they're going to be there and they're going to be on stage with me to introduce the film. So that's really cool. The next day, I'm doing this little scene with Linnea Quigley. And then on the 4th of December, it is our final solo show with Robin Asquith. We've done over a hundred shows with him, more than a hundred, um, over ten years. And he's he's still gonna do the two handers with George Layton and other people. Uh, but he's thinking now that the solo shows take it out of him a bit. And also because he's doing a lot of filming off the back of them, he's um he's got this series, The Madden Blanc Mysteries, and that's now on the they're going to be filming the fourth series and a Christmas special next year, and that's in Malta. So that's at the Phoenix, our final one. But like Soft Cell and all the bands, they always say the final gig, but he's probably already planning yeah. his comeback next year. So that's our final one of the year is the 4th of December. And then next year we are opening up with a London's Burning reunion at the Cinema Museum in January. Uh, another Bill one in March, the Bill Reunion 10, and one that's, I've never seen it, the film, but Kez, we're doing um, a screening of Kez with Di Bradley in, I think that's April at the um, Cinema Museum, and we're going to do a Mind Reunion, so things are changing, things are changing around, we were doing Sweeney Reunions, oh, that's it, we've got Sweeney Reunion on Saturday, um, but next year we're going to try Minder because everyone talks about Minder and wants us to do one. Well, I think probably the easiest thing for anyone to do is go to your website. Uh, well, our website, social... I, I, yeah, I don't really update the website. Oh, okay. Much. Then let's do that. It's all the social media stuff. It's all the social media stuff. All right. Well, if you give, uh, what's, 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 uh, 
we'll, we'll put we'll put it in the link in with this uh, okay. this podcast so people can see it because I think there's just so much going on and you never know what half that's going on at Misty Moon because you seem you seem I'm head. saying because you seem to have so many new things on it like you've you, one day you're doing you know Romanesque next it'll be a Madeline Smith or a another reunion and you know amazing it's things. all over the place yeah it is <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit bonkers but it's it great is. bonkers it's great bonkers. And I think it'll be, and I think it's good that you're looking towards doing some maybe uh, Zoom or something like that on some of these events because it's all right for me. I could turn up, but other people yeah. around the world they can't, and it's not really fair because you've got yeah. such and, stuff and going on. And we do hear, and we do hear that a lot because I think for those two years it was mad the lockdown. You know, what would you do? We even put our film festival online, and I had Diane and Sandy as judges, so we had them set up wherever they were in America at the time. Uh, we had Lindsay Drew and Ben Dover that were living over in Spain at the time. So we had them as judges and we had Judy Matheson here and Suzanne Maddock from the bill was hosting it. And and we showed 10 short films and uh, I think we had 150 people online at the time and we didn't have one glitch and it lasted for three hours. And, and you know that's mad. So even the filmmakers could actually be involved because we we do show um, American or French or Portuguese films at our film festivals, but hardly any of the um, filmmakers can come over unless they're yeah. already based here. So at least that way they were all part of it. So we've got to try and work out how this would work, really. Yeah, but I'm sure I'm sure you get there. Wait, wait, Stuart, it's been lovely talking today. Uh, the film that we were talking was Paradolia. Where can people? You, it's going to be at Darkfest. Is it Darkfest? Uh, um, let me see. So that's in two weeks' time, twenty fifth. It's going to be shown at Horror on Sea as well in January, and then uh, Horror on Sea Rob... is. I know Horror on Sea. It's, it's not South End. Good, South End. Okay, yep. South yep. End. Uh, that's in January, and it's at the Rumford Film Festival. I think that's either January or February. And we are actually in a competition. We're actually at the Ealing uh, International Film Festival uh, next week on the 24th of November. So it's going to be a, so for like Dark Fest and Horror on Sea, you can buy tickets to go. You did something, there was something in Los Angeles, wasn't there? I that was, was last just... week. Yeah, it was shown okay. in Santa Monica and Diane went to that. I mean, oh, we okay. would all love to have gone to it, but <laughs> yeah, but she was there and she went and she supported it, and, and that was fantastic. But, and for them as well, for the festival, to have Diane Franklin there was great. Yes, yeah, so Misty Moon's taking over the world eventually. Hopefully. Great stuff. <laughs> all right. Anyway.